The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Every day, about 2 million kids in Ontario are eligible to, and supposed to, go to school. Some of them, however, just won't go. For them, their parents and teachers, those absences can reflect and result in real trouble. We'll learn more about that tonight. Then we'll hear from Ontario's most significant champion for the rights of the disabled, David Lepofsky, about how well this province is meeting the special education needs of kids. It's Tuesday, March 28th, and that's next on The Agenda. Believe it or not, about 25% of students in all grades will avoid going to school at some point in their educational lives. That according to the nonprofit organization Anxiety Canada. And the pandemic, it seems, only made that worse. What's causing students to miss class, sometimes chronically, and what can parents and teachers do about it? Let's find out more from D.P. Sir, CEO of the Ontario Association of Social Workers. Nathan Kaur, President of the Ontario Teachers Federation. Cheryl Boswell, Executive Director of Youth Mental Health Canada. And Family Counselor, Alison Schaefer. And it's great to have everybody around our table for this discussion tonight. Cheryl, let's just make sure we all know what we're talking about here. School avoidance or chronic absenteeism, call it what you want, define it. What is it? That's a good question. Um, well, it's a complex mental health disability um, that uh, is very, uh, presents very individually. So each story of school phobia, avoidance and absence looks quite different. Um, it's interesting you called it a mental health issue as opposed to kids just screwing off and not wanting to go to school. Exactly. So it's not... And We're all issues the form, impact lab. mental health and wellness. Hmm. So, you know, whatever the causes are, the impact and how uh, it um, presents in young people is intense school induced anxiety hmm. that uh, interferes with a student's ability to access and manage an education. How much of it's going on right now? Um, well, I mean, this is, uh, you know, it, the rates are increasing. Um, you know, people are tracking attendance more because of COVID and virtual learning. So before the pandemic, this was an issue. In some schools, 20, 25% up to, I've, you know, worked with some schools, 80% of the student population is absent due to mental health. Challenges and, and disabilities. When you say absent, you have to be away for how long for that co to for, constitute? Yeah, the definition of chronic absence is two days a month. So total of about 18 days a year, a school year. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, chronic absence is a huge issue. Gotcha. Let's uh, look at a quote here. This is Maria Rogers, Canada Research Chair in Child and Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing from a Globe and Mail editorial. Sheldon, I'll ask you to bring this graphic up and I will read along for those listening on podcast. Chronic absenteeism, which is defined as, here we go, missing 10% or more of school days, about two days for each month, had already been extensively studied by education and psychology researchers prior to the pandemic. It has been linked with a multitude of adverse student outcomes from early to late childhood, poor academic achievement, lower emotional well-being, and early termination from high school. Importantly, high rates of absenteeism among students in the earliest grades can have a snowball effect throughout a child's schooling experience. Students who are chronically absent as early as kindergarten are far more likely to drop out of high school compared with children who are not routinely absent in the early grades. Nathan, pick up the story if you would. How has this worsened thanks to COVID-19? I, th I think the, one of the largest challenges is that why are the students absent? Uh, I, I can appreciate your perspective and, and uh, pointing to mental health but um, there must be more reasons than that on the table, especially coming out of a, a pandemic where we still have illnesses happening within the schools and we still have um, uh, teachers that are looking into their classrooms and uh, the absences are occurring. And um, who has the, who's, obligation is it to find out why and to do something about it well we're going to certainly explore that in our conversation here tell us what's at stake academically when you miss a lot of school you're behind uh, you have to catch up 
and uh, it, it creates anxiety for the the uh, the student, and the, and the teacher then has to try to um, uh, differentiate, change that that programming to accommodate those absences, and it, it creates stress for not just the student but the the, the system as a whole. And I'm sure the parents out there uh, are who are dealing with. Um, a child at home when they should be in school, it's hard for them as well. DP, can you speak to the mental health angle in this as well as opposed to, because when we think of kids cutting class, we often think because they'd rather hang out at the mall mm -hmm. or they want to go smoking behind the school and just don't want to go to class. This is not that, what we're talking about here. Well, I think, you know, my colleagues have pointed to a couple of really important things. The a pandemic had a huge impact on students. Three things come to mind for me. The first is we've seen a rise in mental health issues being reported by children and youth, things like bullying, worried sleep, anxiety, depression, um, eating disorders, relationship troubles. Uh, secondly, learning gaps, right? We've talked about kids going to school and then being virtual and returning back and masking. That's been difficult. And if you're worried about falling behind with your grades or worried you're not matching up to your peers, you're going to be worried about your success and your future. And then thirdly, I think a lot about socialization, social development. Missing out on school meant you can develop peer networks, develop friendships, you can conflict resolve the same way. Those things contribute to absenteeism, which, as you pointed out, is a, is a sign of something bigger going on. And we have an opportunity to think about that uh, with mental health supports right in the school. Let me pick up on, on not just what you miss in terms of academics and grades, when you don't go to school, but the social interaction skills you need to develop just by being there. What do you miss out when you miss school? We're social creatures, right? <laughs> Our motivation is to go be social, and then learning is a byproduct of that. If you, We know that besides class size, one of the biggest impacts on education is whether or not you perceive that your teacher likes you. Your grades go up when you like your teacher, you like your classmates. And so we send our children off to these institutions that are basically the second social institution of their lives. Mm -hmm. If they can't find their connection, their purpose, meaningfulness, um, kind and caring attitudes where they can flourish, then they're going to shut down. And the truth is there is a culture issue happening at our schools right now. If you feel that they're not safe, if you don't, if you feel invisible, you're not seen, you're not understood, you're being you know, put through a meat grinder, you're not going to perform. And so I think just the same way that we're seeing that that in the workplace people are quietly quitting and not wanting to come back and you know go back into the workplace to work we're seeing students that have said you know i could like lie in bed and watch youtube i can get my work done in a couple of hours in the afternoon hand it in um i don't really need to show up and put up with the excruciating social environment of our high schools right now. So I think there is a, a bigger problem that we have to look at, and these are kids trying to self-manage around it. You say the second so, uh, social institution, the first being? The family, their family. the family unit. Yeah, there yeah. we go, gotcha. Cheryl, let's get, and again, we're, we're talking about those who have, as your book there suggests, a phobia about going to school. We're not talking about people who are just being truant here. Why don't they want to go? It's a good question. Um, uh, Youth Mental Health Canada did the first sur survey on school phobia in Canada. There's not the research in Canada. There's not the legislation. There's not the needs-based educational accommodations or funding. There's not the national leadership um, in elementary and secondary for students with permanent disabilities or direct funding to families to, to support their students, their children with mental health disabilities. So, you know, when we look at all those, so in terms of the survey, what we found, which was shocking to me because it's quite opposite to what you see in international research is the average age for warning signs of school phobia, five years old. Mm -hmm. So early on, the school building represents so much to some students, whether it's performance anxiety, social anxiety, whatever it is. Um, and when I was in the Netherlands in October at an international conference on school attendance, it was echoed by a number of researchers. They're starting to identify five years old as the early warning signs. That's really important information for us if we're gonna look at early intervention, preventative, proactive, practical strategies to supporting students. So, you know, because unsupported mental health disabilities increase and increase suicide risk factors. Hmm. So this is not just, you know, um, they're absent, what can we do? This is a moral imperative. This is, as an education system, 
Um, education is a service. There's human rights, compliance, and obligations that are required. Um, and it's a social responsibility, taking care, uh, taking better care of each other. All right, before we get there, though, I, I still want to know where they are. They're not going to class. Deepi, where are they going? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. There's a, a lot happening. They're at home. Yeah. Um, you know, they're having trouble getting out of bed oh, sometimes. Wait a minute. They're at home. But it, presumably they've got a parent or a guardian at home who's saying, or time to get up and get going. Or you've got a parent or a guardian that's trying to navigate a few things, virtual work or going into work, returning to work. They've got other kids in the home. Um, you've also got kids who aren't showing up at school or maybe try to get in the school building and can't. Uh, think about the very first time you expressed your worry or your anxiety or, or, or sadness or concern about uh, cyberbullying or friendships might have been at school. And if you don't have the right supports in that school setting, like a, a social worker or another mental health professional, then that early prevention and detection, it doesn't happen. In fact, it gets missed. And, the, and we know there's not enough school social workers to support our education system across Ontario. Well, and, and it leads to a mental health crisis. So, you know, very emotionally dysregulated young people, isolating at home, losing their peer network, the support network from school, um, not right. able to function. Um, you know, parents having to give up jobs or decrease hours for work to stay at home with their children. I mean, it's a huge issue being told it's the parent's responsibility to force the kid into school mm. um, and no supports provided by the school to find a way well, to let get me, back in. Let me pick up on that. Nathan, you're the Ontario Teachers Federation rep here today. So what what does a teacher feel their obligation is when a student is perpetually absent, school phobic as it were. I think any good teacher is going to try their best to do as much as they can in that situation, but they're not trained social workers, they're not school psychologists. Uh, their, their, their job is to provide the curriculum, provide learning. Uh, you need to do, you need to create an incredible learning atmosphere to do that. Um, but there's so much more that is expected of our education system today that wasn't expected in the past. Uh, we are talking about turning to the education system to assist in this issue, um, but we're also pushing on a full inclusionary model within classrooms. And the teacher is expected not just to teach to the middle, but to uh, diversify their teaching all the way from one spectrum of a learner to another. No, I get you. But and, and they don't have time to be able to... They're going to try their best. I, I get you, but uh, d does a teacher see it as his or her responsibility to, for example, phone the parents, find out why the kid's not there? That I, kind I, of thing. I think if there's no one else to do it, they're going to try, they're, they're going to attempt as much as they can to make that connection to follow up. Uh, but there's only so much you can do when uh, you have so many other obligations on the table. And, and I think what Nathan has to say, you know, I don't know if you're going to say the same thing, is the teacher can't do it alone. Yeah. It's a school-wide exactly. approach that's needed, and that's what I get at with this book, mm -hmm. um, supporting students with school phobia for families and schools, that we need a it very a comprehensive, system. coordinated approach with you know, involvement from everyone, whether, you know, through starting with the education support team. Well, let me get some facts on the admin. table on that. Okay. Here we go. Uh, Sheldon, middle of page three here. Let's get this graphic up. Because these are the supports for students in school, sort of. Most elementary schools report less than one full-time guidance or teacher counselor. While most secondary schools report one full-time guidance or teacher counselor. In terms of mental health supports, one in four schools reported no available psychologist. More than half of schools reported having a full-time social worker. Most reported an option to connect virtually to a psychologist or social worker. And more secondary schools have a regular youth or social worker than elementary schools. Uh, okay, so that's where it's at. Do you think that's adequate? That's astounding. So think about that. Where our kids are, our children are, our youth are, each and every single day. We have 20,000 social workers in Ontario. Of course, not all of them are in schools. We have you know, social workers across a number of settings. 4,800 Ontario schools, 
and less than a thousand school social workers. Mm -hmm. And if you're a school social worker, you might be having five, 10 or 13 schools on your caseload uh, across a large geography, which means less visibility for students, uh, teachers, school administrators, boards who are working so hard to try to wrap around these students. And that means we're not there for that early prevention, the early detection, and connecting people back in the community. So we've been asking our government to step up, fund one social worker per school, mm -hmm. so that you have that support system and you can create that care and that well-being each and Full every time. day. Okay. Full time. How Absolutely. close are we to that? Uh, well, let's hope your listeners and our government are listening today. But we, we do have conversations, and we've been asking for that budget to be uh, part of that uh, uh, regulation and, and part of the regulatory bodies each and every day. Awesome. Yeah, I, I, yes, we need more. 100% completely agree. But I also know that the last thing a student wants to do is be excused from class so that they can go have their therapy session down the hall and all their friends know it. Mm. You know, that, that a lot of what we're talking about from a mental health perspective is the preventative part of creating healthy relationships. What better place to have healthy relationships than with your peers in your classroom? Like that is a healing environment if we do it right. So I think we need teacher training yeah. around how to build a classroom culture that is cohesive and bonding and healing instead of having to wait until there's a mental health breakdown and then we have to send them down the hall to account to a, a mental health professional. We, I think we need to be more preventative. That's, yeah. I, Follow I, up on that though with parents. If it, I, I'm sure we've got parents watching or listening right now for whom this is an issue and they are at their wits end and they don't know what to do. What do you recommend? In terms of getting their child engaged yeah. in school? So again, you're talking about complete school, uh, you know, um, uh, I, I, I would say part of the spectrum that's more severe than what I see in my in my counseling practice. In my counseling practice, I see a lot of kids that have got disengaged from learning, and they have basically think that school is a bit of a joke. You know, we can make it up in in credit recovery. Um, you know, they're gonna. I don't have to hand in any of my things. They'll just take two papers and like they. Okay, that's not phobia. Not, that's truancy. It, it, it's it's a it's a poor attitude about what is happening in for academia for them, and we, they're disengaged learners as what I would call them, which I think is different than having an anxiety uh, as an underlying piece to that. So when we look at that, a lot of it is about empowering parents to be able to set limits and boundaries. It's like parents who don't have a hard time getting their kids to bed at night or taking their tech away or getting them to school. There's a big piece of this, which is about empowering parents to be able to say, your child needs more boundaries and guardrails for them to be successful and as frustrated as you are let's get those parents resourced so that they feel empowered enough to say I, I need to I need to step up the population that I work with and I agree it's not you know I'm, it's, my, it's my my sector in my private practice may be unique so this isn't going to apply to everybody but those parents need to step up but that's a They're different that that's looks a, different that's, yes yeah. I think it's a different that's different I think it's from a, this yeah yeah that looks school. different than stressors like mm -hmm. instable, unstable housing, right. uh, food insecurity. I can't uh, deal with the racism or the cyberbullying. Mm -hmm. That looks really different, and we know that's directly linked to absenteeism, which is a little different than you know a disengaged uh, student. Ab absolutely. absolutely, the and commonality exists. The commonality exists that when a student is absent, someone needs to find out why. Mm -hmm. Who? And who is going to do that? Yeah. And you know what? The teacher is there. They have that connection. They have that. Uh, relationship they're the they're the point person often in that especially in the elementary school system where the uh, they're the classroom teacher in high school it's a little different you know there's that division within the the different subjects and 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 you kind of turn to well who is going to make that phone call home um, but then it comes down to time it comes down to uh, the amount of students in a classroom the uh, the uh, the amount of um, time available outside of the classroom, but you're make, not making the call on your, your, your lunch break while you're making photocopies well, and running you. around. I get you, but I, but I, I mean, there, presumably there is a list of potential options here. Either the principal's gonna do it, or the guidance counselor's gonna do it, or the teacher's gonna do it, or... Or I mean, the some, social worker. Or the social right. worker. Yeah. Somebody in that setting has to be responsible for looking into this. Who is that person? And I would suggest if the expectation is that it's the teacher, you have to give them the time to do so. Right. But if the ding, expectation ding, ding. that there's a social worker there and, and you have that ability well, and you have that people. imagine a social worker and a teacher working together to, to get to the bottom of it. Who's trained, because right. you're going you're gonna to maybe encounter some significant major issues at a home that how can we all be specialized in as, as an educator, as a teacher, a great point, where Nathan. there may be some 
individuals that do have that expertise all the way from how to address them to make a welcoming environment to dealing with significant mental health issues. Yeah, and I think it's not a choice you know, not to do. So, uh, you know, if you create an education support team, you have everyone working together, including the family, a critical component of this. The assessment forms, step by step, are in this guidebook. And then the action plans, you need an education support plan, you need a reentry plan, and all students need a mental wellness action plan. So when they're struggling, they know what to do. Okay, hang so, on, I, I need to know more about that. Every student in a- I believe- Two million students in the province, they all need a mental health action plan. Mental wellness mental action wellness. plan. What does that look like? Good question. So often what happens in the clinical setting is, a, you know, a, a young person or an adult is in crisis and they might make a safety contract. And it has, there's different terminology, but it's often called a safety contract. And often doesn't work because someone in a crisis is uh, dysregulated. So they're not at their best, they're struggling and whatever. So um, the best for me, for all young people, is create a mental wellness action plan. So you look at, it's sort of developing self and emotional awareness. You are aware of your stressors, your triggers, your resources in the community, resources in the school, uh, making those kinds of uh, resources transparent so there's more awareness of oh you know these a social worker is available a psychologist in the school child and youth care worker this is what they do in the community who can I go to who makes that plan young people they make it with and they can on update it and um, there's also apps that you can use there's um, a brother and sister from the United States the not okay app free you put in five trusted uh, contacts in it, um, also identifying trusted adults in your school community. And I think what you were mentioning earlier is what we need to do is build mental wellness protective factors in mm -hmm. schools. So increasing suicide risk factors, we've done a lot of research internationally. We know there's two, it's a two-pronged kind of thing that increases. So a thwarted sense of belongingness, so you don't feel you belong and, or, and you feel like a burden. And, you know, so if we really engage young people in curriculum that's meaningful and relevant, so they're more engaged in what's happening, using their strengths and motivators, but also looking at building a sense of community, connection, and belonging. Let's get some feedback on that. What do you think of this idea? Yeah, I think the, it's great to have a wellness action plan. And I love that we're calling it preventative mm -hmm. because the issues are um, longstanding. And we know 70% yeah. of issues in child and uh, that happen in adolescence start in childhood mental health issues. And so if we don't start early and we don't work in schools and in, in, in doctor's offices and in the communities that children frequent with their families, we're gonna see long-term impacts. Mm -hmm. So building that wellness plan is crucial, but you know what? So is the stability of the support to do that. Mm -hmm. And so while children and adolescents can do that work, well, they also need a trained professional to work in a setting that can help them with that. In the school, outside of the school, at home, working with their families, addressing issues like racism and bullying that have been on the rise, like violence. These are important things that are impacting kids and their decision-making, their self-esteem each and every day. Mm -hmm. A mental wellness action plan for each student? What do you think? It just needs to be built into the entire educational system. It shouldn't feel like such a standalone thing. I think that is where maybe the stigma comes in. Um, we should be teaching kids that from, right, all the way from daycare all the way through. That should just be part of what we do. And that's why my sort of my, I agree with you and that I, again, I come from a, a long line of teachers, a lot of friends that are teachers and they're overburdened. They're, they're, they're told to do everything. I know I got to socialize your kid. I got to teach your kid. I got, <laughs> I get that they're overburdened, but we need to decide as a society, what is going to be the most important thing and where are we going to put our resources? Sure. Do we need to get that first report card out in November or can we spend September getting to know one another? We mm -hmm. can decide to do it differently. We need educational reform. We need to put the soft, um, uh, emotional learning piece has to be a priority. I mean, if, and if would, we don't, I mean, we're seeing what happens when we don't. Who cares if you have somebody who's got a PhD in engineering who's suicidal? Like, we, it, it, this yeah. is, it, we just, we have to put it as a priority. And that was the benefit of COVID. 
that it uprooted everything we knew about education and the school building and this is the you know status quo we were capable of really being innovative and being very needs focused how do we engage students how do we you know what do we do in terms of virtual learning and and to really um, you know, I mean, it, there were a lot of benefits for, uh, you know, from the experience of COVID going through it, and that schooling models can change, and that we can direct our, the way that we do education to the needs of students. Mm -hmm. Can I circle back to something with you, though, Nathan? And that is, we talked about students who are not engaged because they're not particularly interested in what's going on in the classroom. Do you think a change in curriculum would help address that issue? I think the any changes of curriculum, a teacher, a good teacher is going to put in place what they need to put in place. But it's how you put in place it. It's, it's how you connect that curriculum to the student. Mm -hmm. Often what we do in learning, it's not, it's, it's important what you learn, but teaching children how to learn is, is the ultimate goal. For sure. Right? And, and so curriculums come and go. What the, what the core of the piece is that we're providing them, but if we can meet the needs of the student and sometimes that is adapting to the curriculum to what they're interested in or how they see themselves relevant in the future um, right now when needs are not being met it's, it's it's like a fight or flight and we're talking about the flight today um, but you know there's another conversation on the table where uh, it, there's a fight and when needs are not being met and, and we see both of those coming out today in the classroom needs are not being met some of it's avoidance, some of it's mental health, some of it's violence in the classroom. It, it, it does exist and, and we just needed to do a better job. Okay, we're less than five minutes to go here and I know Stephen Lecce, the education minister, is watching because he watches this program every <laughs> night. I know that. <laughs> Even when we don't do education, I know he watches all the time. Anyway, we got four smart people here to give him some advice. Fire away. What does he need to do? Start with putting a school social worker in every single school across the province, working with the team, working with your education professionals so they can help identify these issues early and also connect people back in the community. We don't want kids pulled out of class for therapy sessions and counseling sessions. We want them connected to the right resources, right time, and managing and regulating their emotions early on. Okay, you said we have 4,800 schools. We have social workers in 1,000 schools? Less than 1,000 school social workers out there. So we, we want, we want 4,800 schools with at least one social worker in a school. Imagine what that feels like to be able to know the social worker in your school, to be able to walk down the hall, say hello, know that you have a place that you can talk and you can get connected. Okay, hang on. Should I do the math here? How much do you have to pay to get a social worker? Well, I'll tell you this. The, the recent budget is uh, over $30 billion announced around uh, mental health in schools in particular. Certainly, that's a small dent to put one social worker into schools. I'm going to say it's $75,000 to put a social worker in a school. Does that sound right? Sure. $75,000 times. If there's 1000 in, then we need 3800 more. Okay. That's $285 million for mm -hmm. social workers alone. Now, can don't, we do that? Don't forget, some schools are only a couple hundred students. So certainly, you can think about geography. Northern schools, the, the needs are different. You know, so we need we need to think about geography. But what we know is at least one access to school social worker, based on the geography and based on the number of students per school, is crucial, because that's where it starts. The conversations you were talking about engagement and talking about school stressors, because it's, absenteeism is just a sign that something more is going on. Stressors. Talk to Stephen Lecce. Yeah, well, I'm thinking about this fame, this great poster that we used to have that said something like, wouldn't it be a great day when every school was fully funded and the Navy had to hold a bake sale to get a new, um, you know... Um, Fighter jet or whatever. Yeah, right? We have the money. We have the money. We need, we need to put the money where the money is needed. So, Stephen Lecce, put some budget behind this so that we can get teachers trained so that we can slow things down to get these kids back re-engaged. We can deliver that curriculum eventually. I believe ABC, acceptance, belonging, and then the delivery of curriculum. And if we don't get these school communities re-engaged as safe havens for kids to want to go and be with friends and to be seen, then they will start to flourish. So we need to slow it down and fund those teachers and slow down education 
Double the salaries of teachers. How's that? That's always <laughs> Is that good. good? Put that in your calculator. <laughs> I don't think Let's respect <laughs> teachers and Nathan's what gonna, they do. Not gonna I think, I think that. that's a tough ask. <laughs> Nathan, yes, I was going to say. How long yep. have you been asking for that? Yes. That's, uh, aside from doubling teacher salaries, yeah. what else would you want to recommend? Um, let's just work together to meet the needs of students and, and, and be thoughtful in uh, asking the right questions. If we're talking about student absences, there's there's a there's a there's a solution to that, but we need to know why people are away. Uh, whether it is uh, those those anxieties of school, the uh, curriculum not uh, connecting with them, the panel should be for students here that are not attending school. Hmm. That's a great follow-up idea. I like that. Cheryl, last word to you. Um, I think we need to value young people, we need to value education, and we need to value families with action. Um, I think all schools need to have a photocopyable guidebook on supporting mm -hmm. students with school phobia so they've got the resources and the coordinated comprehensive um, supports and action to do it. Um, I think they need to take all schools, need to have a school phobia workshop. Um, or attend a training course that I'm starting on Saturday for professionals. I think uh, we need national leadership. Um, I think families need direct funding to support, uh, like, um, you know, for other families uh, with children who have disabilities so that they know what their children need um, to access and manage an education. Disabilities is coming up next. That's the next part of our program. That's Cheryl Boswell from Youth Mental Health Canada along with D.P. Sir from the Ontario Association of Social Workers, and on the other side of the table, Nathan Kaur from the Ontario Teachers Federation, Alison Schaefer, the family counselor. It's great to have all four of you here at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks, Steve. Thank you. You might be surprised to hear that one out of every six students in the province of Ontario has a need for some kind of special education. How well are we doing at ensuring these kids get the kind of education they require and deserve? For that, we go to Midtown Toronto and David Lepofsky, the volunteer chair of the AODA Alliance. David has been a frequent guest on the program and has been visually impaired for most of his life. And we are delighted to welcome you, David, back to our program. How are you doing? Doing good and always happy to be here. Excellent. Let's start with some big picture questions and then we're going to zero in on a few of the specifics. Overall, to the best of your knowledge, is the verdict in yet on what impact the pandemic had on kids with learning disabilities? Well, kids with all disabilities were set back in, during the pandemic. All kids were set back, but the impact on kids with disabilities was even more substantial because the government's response to the pandemic in our schools uh, was one size fits all tailored uh, to kids without disabilities. So our kids were behind the eight ball uh, from the beginning. And let's make the distinction here, learning disabilities versus students with disabilities. Do you want to just clarify that for us? Well, learning disabilities is a reference to a particular uh, uh, population within students with disabilities, those with a particular uh, information processing deficit. Uh, but we're talking about kids with all kinds of disabilities, kids who are deaf, kids who are blind, kids with autism, kids with intellectual disabilities, mental health conditions, all kids with disabilities. So this is what I'm talking about. Gotcha. Now, the government has acknowledged that a lot of kids did fall behind during the pandemic. And as a result, they have set aside hundreds of millions of dollars in their budgets for tutoring and that kind of thing so that parents can get their kids caught up. Can you tell us, again, based on what you're hearing out there, whether or not that's working? For kids with disabilities, it's yet another uh, failed initiative because it's, again, one size fits all. Great for kids who have no disabilities. Maybe they just need a little tutoring with math or something. They hire someone, but there isn't like, this population of special education tutors out there you could hire to, rep to provide the surge in catch-up learning that kids with disabilities need because they fell so much further behind during the pandemic. So generally speaking, how highly or not would you rate Ontario's current efforts to get the appropriate education to kids, not just with learning disabilities, as we've established, but with all disabilities in general? Uh, I'd say compared to what we're capable of, to care, compared to what our kids need, very poor. We have a school system which is replete with disability barriers, uh, not because anybody wanted it that way, 
but because that's the way it's operated. The government's had sitting on its desk for the Ontario government, the Ford government's had sitting on its desk for over 14 months, a comprehensive report on what those barriers are and how to fix them, the most thorough top to bottom review of the education system through, from the perspective of students with disabilities in my lifetime. And so far, the number of changes that they've announced as a result of that report total, well, zero. Who did that report? It's called the Kindergarten to Grade 12 Standards Development Committee, appointed by the government, equal members from the disability, half of it was from the disability community. I was one of them. The government appointed me to that committee. And the other half from the education community. So its agenda for reform reflects a consensus between educators, the educator uh, uh, community, and the disability community on what the barriers are and what the fixes are. The government sat on that mass, that, that comprehensive report. We've been pressing for over a year to get them to do something with it. Again, radio silence. You say what the barriers are. Give us one example of a disability barrier that has not been acted upon. Well, uh, parents of kids with disabilities, the first thing they want to know is, what are the options for my child at school? What are the different programs? What are the different options? And uh, they find it enormously difficult uh, too often to just find out what's available. And we said there needs to be a comprehensive strategy to make it easier to find out what's available and if you need to advocate for your child, where to go. So we made comprehensive recommendations on how to fix that. We're not talking about either rocket science or big bucks. And yet, what have we heard back? Um, nothing. Hmm. Now, when you consider disabilities, there is obviously, as you've indicated, quite a wide variety of, uh, of different things we're talking about here. Blind kids obviously need different things than deaf kids do, uh, from autistic kids, from dyslexic kids, et cetera, et cetera. Are we, in your judgment, better at educating some groups of kids with disabilities over others? Well, there's islands of progress for different groups, and I don't want to make it sound like the, the like school boards are doing nothing. I believe that educators, I believe teachers, principals want to do the best things, but the system handcuffs them, makes it harder. They got to resist and fight against the system just to deliver what these kids need. Need the problem is that the overwhelming barriers, like not being able to find out even what's available. Uh, is uh, uh, cuts across the whole system. I'll give you another example. For for each of these kids, the, the board school boards are required by the province, quite properly so, to develop an individualized education plan for the child. Good idea. But what they're not required to do is to offer a meeting with the parents to discuss what should be in the plan. Yeah, they got to consult, but they don't have to offer a meeting. Lots of parents don't even know to ask for it. We recommend that they should. Uh, parents like me who know to ask, we ask and we can get the meeting, but it, it, it shouldn't be selecting in favor of people who happen to know what to ask for. Hmm. How, how hard would that be? It's required by law in the United States to offer such a meeting, but in Ontario, uh, no. Hmm. We know there are supposed to be educational assistance in classrooms, particularly in those classrooms where there is a significant percentage of kids who have disabilities. Do we know whether that's happening? Well, again, it's very hard to track this across the province because it's left to the idiosyncratic variations from school board to school board, from school to school. So a parent who thinks their child needs that who has to advocate for it, has a complete uphill battle finding out what they can ask for, who to ask for it. So I suspect the fair assessment is in some places it's working well, in others it's not. But but the same child can get radically different supports depending on what school they're in or what, what, what uh, school board they're in, uh, even though we're supposed to have an equitable education system. Let's drill down a bit and then talk about uh, specifics here. We know that, for example, uh, the parents of children with autism have done a really good job, um, well, let's just call it what it is, making a hell of a ruckus in order to get uh, more attention for their kids, in order to get their kids into assessments and then into a program. Uh, again, based on what you're hearing, how much progress has been made on that front? Well, they've done an amazing job of getting attention. Unfortunately, they will be the first to tell you that not so much on getting results. When the uh, Ford government came into power, the waiting list for the Ontario Autism Program was 23,000 kids. 
The Ford government has managed to more than double it. It's now upwards of 60,000 kids. Mm -hmm. So uh, th there's been a tension on the problem, but the government's response to the problem has been uh, pretty abysmal. Hmm. How about if you've got I'm a- I'm sorry to keep giving bad news, but I got to tell you how it is. That's why you're here. We want you to tell us how it is. What about hearing impaired children? How are the services for them these days? I'm not really uh, an expert in that, but again, the problem is because the province leaves it from board to board and doesn't properly supervise it. It's really hard to track it, but it's uh, it's uh, it's still again risks being uh, different from province uh, from board to board or school to school. Okay, we're going to do something a little different now because you've been on this program many times and one of the agreements that you and I have in place is that you're happy to talk issues, but you really don't like talking about your own personal circumstances. Well, I have your permission today to do that. And I want to ask you about visually impaired kids because you have one. And I want to know what it's like trying to get a good education for visually impaired kids, including yours, in the province of Ontario. The fact is that the the uh, provisions in Ontario for kids with vision loss are seriously, seriously deficient. Here's the problem. First, uh, there are only, we estimate, because the government doesn't collect the data correctly, maybe 2,000, 2,500 of these, of these uh, children and youth in Ontario. They're a low incidence disability. And I can tell you from bitter experience, if the parents of kids with autism who have bigger numbers, they face an uphill battle, we face a monumental uphill battle because there's so few of our kids and school boards and, and minist the Ministry of Education really treats them uh, as second, second class among the second class citizens of the system, meaning all kids with disabilities. And, and what the problem is, let me, let me summarize the problem like this. We don't expect the classroom teacher to know how to teach a child Braille or the adaptive technology that people like me use to operate uh, a computer or an iPhone. The, the general education uh, teacher can't be expected to know that. But there is a specialist and has for years and decades been a specialist in the school board who specializes in these areas. They're called the teacher of the visually impaired. They're itinerant. They go school to school, work a certain number of hours a week with each uh, blind or low vision uh, child, and they also help the classroom teacher support them so they can deliver education for the majority of the time when they're not in the classroom. We got three problems in Ontario, and we've been telling the government this for five years without any solution. First, the standards for training a teacher of the visually impaired in Ontario are seriously substandard. They are lower than in half or more than half of the province of, uh, provinces of Canada, most of the U.S., England, New Zealand. In those other jurisdictions, I'm talking about like at least half of Canada as well as those other countries, to be a teacher of the visually impaired, because it's such a specialized field, you got to first become a teacher and then get a master's degree specializing in being a teacher of the visually impaired, which includes practicum working with a blind child. Ontario doesn't require that, doesn't provide it. Uh, Ontario says, oh, all you got to do is take three 125-hour uh, training courses, not taught by uh, a professor in a, uh, uh, with a specialty in the field, with a PhD in, a, in, a, uh, in a, a faculty of education. And frankly, you only have to take one uh, to get your first job working with blind kids. And during that course, you never have to get any hands-on experience working with a blind child. That's ridiculous. And by the way, this is not only bad policy, it's serious discrimination compared to the proper way Ontario treats deaf kids. Teachers of the deaf, similar role. Uh, they have to take a one-year equivalent to a master's. The province funds it at York University. It's provided at a university by a faculty of education. Uh, and... Uh, the tuition is covered by the province. So it's, and, and no one in the government denies this or can dispute the facts or justify it as fair. So that's the first problem. Second Listen, problem. Sorry, let me jump in there, David, for a second. So it, are there other provinces that require these higher standards for educating these teachers, but at Ontario does half, not require Maybe it? upwards of eight, but at least half of the province, most of the U.S., New Zealand, Australia. Okay. And two provinces have a master's program, B.C. and Nova Scotia. And we've actually 
connected with the head of the UBC program, University of British Columbia, and said to the province of Ontario, hey, they'd be prepared to have an Ontario uh, university, faculty of education, become a satellite campus. But, you know, years since then, still we're languishing with no action. And, and what this means, let, let me be clear, the teachers of visually impaired in Ontario, the, the majority of whom, the clear majority of whom have no masters, uh, they are dedicated, caring, and hardworking, but they've got a much smaller toolkit, and that's hmm. not fair to them or the kids. Okay, on to number two. Second problem. We have a significant shortage of teachers of visually impaired. The province has been warned for years, has no plan to fix it. So, for example, the biggest school board, uh, I should say, the school board with the biggest number of students with vision loss in Canada is the Toronto District School Board. It's got more than double the number of visually impaired students than uh, it serves, more than a double the number of uh, visually impaired students as we'd, we'd find at the School for the Blind in Ontario. It's a residential school. And, and yet they started uh, this past academic year with uh, upwards of a quarter of their slots for teachers of visually impaired unfilled. There were students who started this past academic year, blind, low vision students, who had no teacher of the visually impaired at all, including my child. And I had to fight like heck to, to just get a teacher of the visually impaired for my child at all, which in, in this year is, in this age, is, is, is ridiculous. But the third problem is that how much support uh, a blind or low vision kid will get, a uh, child will get uh, with, uh, uh, from one, will vary from one school board to the next radically. My child could get upwards of twice the hours per week of teacher of the visually impaired support if we just move from Toronto to York Region. And that's ridiculous. Why is and there a I difference? I told, pardon me, it, it's just because that's what their school board's providing. Hmm. And it varies radically from one fr from one school board to the next how much support a child gets. And, and parents are isolated, are frustrated, are upset, and they have to try to fight these battles, uh, uh, which is really discouraging. I've written the Minister of Education about this two years ago. Uh, I've written them again because they haven't taken any action uh, in January. I've asked for an urgent meeting. Did you hear uh, back at all? Did you at least get no, the letter acknowledged? No. Hmm. No. Uh, they did do a round table back in the summer of 2021 to discuss this, some lower level ministry officials. They acknowledged it needed to be fixed, but since then radio silence and our efforts to get solutions just. So what we need is Stephen Lecce tweeted today that uh, excellence in teachers or educators, that's what people need or want. Well, that's what we want, but the minister has to give the orders to his ministry. We've briefed the deputy minister. We've briefed a revolving door series of assistant deputy ministers at the Ministry of Education. I briefed the director of the ed of education at the Toronto District School Board. Like, we're exhausted saying the same thing, and we've been doing it for half a decade. We need the minister of education to step up to the plate. And the thing, Steve, that, that is so uh, outrageous about this is that we know what the solution is. Uh, it's supported by others in the blindness field, like the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. I speak for an organization of parents of visually impaired children. And we're supported by an organization of expert blindness rehabilitation uh, uh, professionals. So people in the field with expertise know about this, know what needs to be done. The government does speak, doesn't deny there's a problem, but is sitting on their hands. And this shouldn't be a big expensive solution because we're low incidence the solution if we could train up another uh, raise the standards and train up another i don't i'm going to make up numbers 100 150 teachers uh with this extra training with this added qualification get them out deployed we could be solving the problem and go from being really the most embarrassingly behind to being at least comparable if not a leader Okay, David, with 20 seconds to go, give us a website where people can get more information on this. If anybody has a child or knows a child who has vision loss, blind or low vision, contact the Ontario Parents of Visually Impaired Children, www.opvic.ca. We want to get you involved and team up. OPVIC.ca. David, as always, thank you so much for coming on to TVO tonight and giving us a sense of how things are in the province of Ontario today. Thanks so much.
huge ships still ferry billions in goods across the Great Lakes every year. But when they've done their final run, many find their way to a place in Port Colborne, Ontario. I went there to see how the dangerous work of shipbreaking happens and why the global industry could learn something from them. Have a look. This is where ships in the Great Lakes come to die. From freighters like the one behind me to ferries, this yard has been the final resting place for over 100 vessels. The Ojibwe, measuring more than 600 feet long and 67 feet wide, spent nearly 70 years navigating the lakes. Soon to be on the chopping block, the ST Crapo, a nearly century-old self-loading cement carrier arriving from the shores of Green Bay, Wisconsin and the Manistee, a self-unloading bulk carrier with nearly eight decades of nautical mileage arriving by tow in 2022 from Ohio. Their final destination, Marine Recycling Corporation. 27 acres of land riddled with pieces of Great Lakes history. This is the main yard for Ontario's only year-round shipbreaking company. Situated in Port Colborne, Ontario, Marine Recycling Corporation sits near the mouth of the Welland Canal, a busy stretch of waterway that connects ships to Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. There's the Ojibwe wheelhouse we're driving by, and in the spring it'll go on a barge. It's going to be a cottage, I guess, for someone. Wayne Elliott is a shipbreaker, and he's been doing it for more than half a century. So we recycle old ships of all types, warships, freighters, tugs, barges submarines. Uh, we've recycled actually pretty much everything except an aircraft carrier. Amongst the names of the famous vessels he's recycled, a few stand out. Henry Ford II, the, the uh, that was a very popular ship with the museums and people. The Henry Steinbrenner that was named after uh, the former Yankees owner George Steinbrenner, named after his father. There are two ways vessels can arrive at their shipyard from the Great Lakes. Most, like the ST Crapo, are towed by tugboats, while others are steamed in on their own power. Using a combination of torches, cranes, and shears, it could take several months for a freighter like the Ojibwe to end up looking like this. The process generally starts with cutting torches, parts of the ship that are too high for the shears to reach to start with, and uh, lifting out heavy machinery and engines that are not sheared. There are many dangers. It's a dangerous business. We're lifting uh, sections of ships up to 100 tons, and on top of it, they're not new ships, so we have to be very careful that lifts won't tear. Yeah, it, it just has to be safety first. Marine Recycling Corporation collects portholes, lights, and other scraps from the ships, but the main haul is steel. The steel is chewed up into tiny pieces and then loaded onto dump trucks where they're shipped to local steel mills in southern Ontario. Many of the ships Wayne and his team recycle have been on the open waters for decades. For the most part, this yard recycles ships that have spent the majority of their time navigating the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Seaway, better known as Lakers. Lakers can remain in service much longer than their ocean counterparts, also known as salties. The corrosive seawater can do serious damage to a steel ship, which in turn creates a shorter lifespan. But with decades of service comes decades worth of buildup. When a ship arrives under its own power, it has fuel, uh, lubricate and oils, uh, waste oils, it has all of that aboard, so that's the first order of business. In North America, the environment wasn't always as protected as it is now. Wayne has seen the changes firsthand in the three generations his family has been in the industry. My dad worked for another family in Hamilton and started a shipbreaking yard in 1959. I remember as a kid, uh, Believe it or not, they used to burn the ships out to get rid of the furnishings. And uh, even back to the 60s, you know, there was no Environmental Protection Act till 1970. There was no rules. So I can remember my dad in Hamilton, the fire chief and the deputy chief were, were friends as well. And he would call the, the chief or the deputy and say, okay, the wind is headed towards the Skyway Bridge. Okay, to light this up and they would burn out the, the accommodation section of ships. They used to burn copper in those days, and I always remembered the horrible taste in my throat 
Wayne estimates that 95% of the shipbreaking industry contributes to pollution. And it's not just dirty work, it also comes with its risks. Globally, shipbreaking has been described as the world's most dangerous job. In parts of South Asia, the leaders in shipbreaking, that title holds true. According to NGO Shipbreaking Platform, a global collective that monitors environmental harm and human rights abuses, more than 7,000 ships have been scrapped in South Asia since 2009, causing at least 441 deaths and 384 injuries. They don't go after the waste first. In places like Turkey, Bangladesh, India, they use the beaching method where the back end or the stern of the ship, which which has many of the pollutants, the, uh, the machinery spaces, the oil, uh, they're the last thing to be recycled. Even with three other shipyards on Canada's coastlines, Elliot says his biggest competitors are still on the other side of the ocean. We're really against towing these lake vessels across the Atlantic Ocean. At one point, uh, it was about one out of every 20 wouldn't make it. You know, you can imagine the, you know, the potential uh, for an accident. It's very difficult to compete when you're the opposite of that. And, uh, but, you know, so far so good. At one point, Elliot estimates there were half a dozen shipbreakers on the Great Lakes. But for the last 20 years, they've been the only full-time shipbreaking company in Canada. And uh, it's a difficult business. On top of everything, it's a gamble. Uh, I remember one year we brought a ship in in late January and February 1st, the, the price of steel scrap dropped $85 a ton. So we were out a million dollars before we touched the ship. That's the worst part. Despite the challenges that come with shipbreaking, Wayne doesn't see himself stopping anytime soon. We're the most experienced shipbreakers in the world, so I'm kind of proud of that. It's a family tradition. It's what we do. We're, uh, we're the best at it. Uh, we, I love the ships. I mean, I always did. That is the agenda for Tuesday, March 28th, 2023. Tomorrow, why the first economist, Adam Smith, wasn't quite the capitalist the 20th century boosters made him out to be. Also, how understanding the difference between anger and resentment can help explain some political movements today. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow.